Look with me in Exodus chapter 1. Let's talk about mothering history makers. Mothering history makers. Exodus chapter 1, going to start reading in verse 8. This is the story of the Jewish people in Egypt. You remember that during a famine, Jacob moved his family to the land of Egypt. God used Joseph to rescue the family. And uh, after Joseph and the patriarchs died, uh, the people began to multiply. And we'll pick up the story in verse 8 of Exodus chapter 1. And let's read about what happened to the Jewish people. Exodus 1, reading in verse 8. The Bible says, Then a new king, who did not know Joseph, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over the Jewish people to oppress them with forced labor. And the Jewish people built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. They worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. <clears throat> the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt summoned, told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous, and they give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of his own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Now jump with me to chapter 2, if you would. And let's read quickly about the birth of Moses. Exodus chapter 2, reading in verse 1. Now a man from the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, and she coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds, along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and she sent her female slaves to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she had compassion on him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister, asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. So she named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much and your presence with us. Father, I pray that each person would hear a word from heaven this morning. We thank you in Jesus' name. And if your heart agrees, would you say amen and amen. Well, this week I learned some things about Mother's Day that I never knew. Did you know that Mother's Day was founded in the United States by a woman who never married and who never had any children of her own? Her name was Anna Jarvis. 
Anna's mother was a Methodist Sunday school from Sunday school teacher from West Virginia. During the Civil War, Anna's mother started a public health campaign to teach young mothers better sanitary conditions in their homes. Since she lived in West Virginia on the Mason-Dixon line that divided the North from the South, Anna's mother taught this public health program to women on both sides of the conflict. After the war, she saw this as an opportunity to promote reconciliation between families in the North and families in the South. So she used her public health program to reunite neighbors and friends who were parted by the conflict. Her idea was picked up by Christian women in the abolitionist movement and the temperance movement and the suffragette movement that fought for women's right to vote. Finally, Anna came up with the idea of a day to honor her mother and to honor all mothers and their sacrifices. With the backing of a department store owner from Philadelphia named John Wanamaker, Anna held the first Mother's Day celebration in May of 1908 at the Methodist Church in Grafton, West Virginia. By 1912, 45 states had adopted Mother's Day. And in 1914, Woodrow Wilson made Mother's Day an official observance on the national calendar. Here are a few fun tidbits about Mother's Day. The National Retailers Association estimates that this year we will spend over $23 billion celebrating mom. On average, we'll spend about $200 per person on mom. It's estimated that this year we'll spend $2.6 billion sending flowers, $1.5 billion on pampering gifts like spa treatments, $70 million on greeting cards. Mother's Day accounts for 10% of all jewelry sales in the United States. And you'll not be surprised, it is the most popular day of the entire year to eat out because it's certain that dad ain't cooking. <laughs> Today, Americans will spend $3.5 billion in restaurants. More telephone calls are placed on Mother's Day than any other day of the year. And here's my favorite tidbit. After Christmas and Easter, Mother's Day is the third highest attended day in church. So thank you, moms. Moms, we want to know that you are worth it all and you are worth much more. We honor you. We're thankful for you. We celebrate you. I want to share with you quickly about mothering history makers. When we're born into the world, each one of us is born into a continuing story. And the story belongs to him. History is truly his story. God is the beginning and the end of the story of the earth and the human race. And he is in control the entire time. History is the unfolding of God's plan to glorify himself by saving his fallen creation and especially by saving us. Our challenge is to find our place in his story to find the, the role that he has called us to play and then to see that his story continues on after us. And that brings us to the birth of Moses. Did you know that the very first word in the book of Exodus is the word and? And these are the names of the sons that went down to Egypt. In fact, the Hebrew scriptures don't know this book as the book of Exodus. They know it by the title, and these are the names. The English versions of the Bible omit that little Hebrew and, but the and is actually important. And tells us that Exodus is the continuation of the story that God began in Genesis. It is one continuous story. It is his story. 
Interesting, Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy also begin with the word and. But and means that a new chapter has started now. And means a new day is dawning when the things that God promised yesterday will surely come to pass today. And means a new season is coming when the failures and the mistakes of the past are eclipsed by the faithfulness of God to his people in the future. And means a new generation is arising that will carry forward his story to heights previously not known. And means that a generation of history makers is on the way. You know, I believe that's precisely where we're at here at harvest time. This building, phase two, it has a giant and over it. Beloved, listen to me. The completion of this building at the end of June is not the end of the story. It is an and. It is a continuation of the story. It's a continuation of the story of his church in the world. It's a continuation of the story of our church that started in 1983. But this is a new beginning. It's a new chapter in the story. I want to tell you, if you've only recently come to Harvest Time, you have come at the right time. I believe that a new day is on the horizon, that a new season of miracles and fulfilled prophecy is upon us. I believe that a new generation of history makers is ready to come forth. A generation that will carry his story forward. And it's our job to give birth to them in the spirit and to nurture them. Looking at the birth of Moses, I see seven qualities of women who are used by God to mother history makers. I want to talk to you about them quickly. We don't have our screens. They are, they tell me, on the way somewhere. I think they must be, they're coming from China. They must be stuck in the Panama Canal. I'm not certain. Uh, they are coming. They did ask us for some paperwork this week. Uh, some tax-exempt paperwork so that when they do get to port they can clear customs without paying tax on them but someday they'll be here but in the meantime we've printed for you some outlines and you can use that to follow along and fill in the blanks if you like uh, don't be don't be worried about the number seven we do have a, a dinner rest uh, reservation for four this afternoon so I will surely let you out by 3 30 so that we can get to no I'm kidding all right Mothering history makers, seven qualities of women used by God. Mothering history makers, seven qualities of women used by God. First of all, God uses women who are called. God uses women who are called. You know, one thing that sets the Bible apart from any other world religion is the prominent role that women play. From the very beginning and, and all the way through, women are highly esteemed. Women are, are valued by God and they are used by God. God promised that a woman would give birth to the Savior, Jesus, who redeemed the fallen world. And as his story unfolds in the Old Testament, women are heroines of the faith. They are leaders, they are prophetesses, they are worshipers, they are faithful mothers of history makers. In the New Testament, we find that women were key to the ministry of Jesus. And in the New Testament church, women are listed as serving in every one of the fivefold ministry offices of the church. There are women in the New Testament who are called apostles, there are women who are called prophets, who are called evangelists, pastors. And teachers. In the story of Moses, there is not just one woman, but there are actually five women who were instrumental in the birth of this history maker. Two of the women, Shipra and Pua, were medical professionals. 
They put off having families of their own in order to pursue their careers. Eventually, God did bless them with families of their own, but at the start of Moses' story, they were not mothers yet. Jochebed was a mother of three, unable to care for her newborn child. She was unable to protect him, so she had to give him up for adoption. Miriam was a loving sister who, as far as we know, never married nor had kids of her own, but she dedicated her life in service to God. Pharaoh's daughter was an adoptive mom. We don't know anything else about her except that she opened her heart and she loved a child as her own that she did not give birth to. So it wasn't just one woman, but it was all these women from different walks of life, women in different circumstances that God used. And can I tell you that God still uses women from all different walks of life and from all different experiences. God uses professional women who are strategically placed in executive positions by him. He uses women who are not yet moms, but might be someday. He uses women who are overwhelmed moms. He uses women who are adoptive moms. He uses women who might never give birth to children of their own, but whose hearts are full of his love. He uses women who are poorly resourced, and he uses women who are abundantly resourced. But here's what I want you to see this morning. God called each one of these women to be precisely where she was in order for a history maker to be born and nurtured. God called two charged nurses to be in a precarious ethical dilemma, caught between obeying God or obeying their boss, who happened to be a brutal, bloodthirsty dictator. God called Jochebed to be pregnant at a very perilous time in the world. He called Miriam to be the vigilant older sister of an endangered baby brother. Although we don't know the details, God called Pharaoh's daughter to be in a situation in her life where an abandoned baby filled an empty place in her heart. In her own way, each woman was called by God into his story. And God is still calling women today into his story. Listen, if you find yourself in a difficult place on this Mother's Day, could it be that God is the one who called you there? If you find yourself in a, a difficult place at, at work right now, toiling under an uncaring unethical boss, if you find yourself in a difficult place in your marriage or in your parenting, in your health, in your finances, if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're lonely right now, could it be that God is the one has, that has called you to the place you're at because he's calling you into his story? Could it be that the difficult place where God has you is just where he needs you so that you're positioned to play a critical role in birthing and nurturing a history maker? Could it be that God wants you to see this moment in your life not as the end of your story, but as the and in his story? God's called you to this moment as a prelude to the mighty thing he's about to do next. Mothering history makers, seven qualities of women used by God. God uses women who are called, and second, God uses women who are courageous. Every one of the women involved with Moses' birth was courageous, but I want to focus for just a moment on the courage of the two Hebrew midwives. Some 300 years after Jacob moved his family to Egypt, a new dynasty came to power. The new pharaoh did not know Joseph. Now, with such a large Jewish population, it's certain that the pharaoh knew the story of Joseph. It's certain that he knew how the Jews came to be in Egypt. He just didn't care. 
He didn't care what happened yesterday, and he certainly didn't care about Joseph's God. Can I tell you, it's still true today that the spiritual experiences of the last generation mean absolutely nothing to the next generation. I was watching this last week, a wonderful video uh, clip from the mid-80s. It was from Rama Bible Camp. Powerful, powerful move of the Holy Spirit in a church service. But I was watching and the, they had the 80s hair and the 80s clothing, the 80s suits and the 80s ties and they were singing 80s music. I, I tease my kids all the time. I tell them so much good church you missed in the 80s and the 90s. But you know what? The truth is they don't care. The, 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 the next generation doesn't care about the experiences of the last generation. They need to experience God for themselves. But God was already on the move. There was an and that was already at work. The promise of multiplication that God had made to Abraham and repeated to Isaac and Jacob, it was starting to be fulfilled within the space of just a few centuries. The Jewish people grew from a family of 70 to a nation of millions. That is unprecedented population growth. Like all dictators, the new pharaoh was insecure and paranoid. So he took four measures to curb the growth of the Jewish population. First of all, he enslaved them, hoping that it would discourage their procreation. But, but God increased the rate of the population growth more than ever. Then pharaoh made their slavery bitter. Seven is significant in the book of Exodus. And in chapter one, there are seven different words that are used to describe the harshness of the Egyptians' treatment of the Jewish slaves. But there are also seven different words used to describe how God kept multiplying them and multiplying them. The more Pharaoh turned up the heat, the more God sped up the baby factory. Desperate, Pharaoh called the two Hebrew charge nurses who were over all the midwives. He told them if the Hebrew women give birth to a boy, quickly suffocate the child and tell the parents it was stillborn, but let the girls live. You see, girls could become slave wives to Egyptians and they could make more Egyptians, but he went after the boys. But the Bible says that the midwives feared God. Listen to me, somebody listen to me, they feared God more than they feared the king. You see, the midwives knew that to extinguish a human life, even in infancy, is to defy God. It's direct disobedience to God's moral law. It's to direct disobedience to God's explicit commands. He said, thou shalt not commit murder. The midwives knew that a program devised to extinguish innocent infant lives was in direct opposition to God's purpose in creation. God commanded mankind to multiply, to fill the whole earth. In Isaiah 45, verse 18, God says, I didn't create the earth to be empty. I created it to be inhabited. Beloved, God is pro-people. God is pro-population growth. He is pro-babies. He is pro-children. He is pro-families. God is pro-life. And the midwives also knew that a program devised to extinguish Jewish babies was in direct opposition to the promises that God had made and was now fulfilling. 
God promised Abraham, he said, I am going to make your descendants as numerous as the dust of the earth. I am going to make them as numerous as the stars of the sky. And this was the work that God was now beginning to perform to take the lives of Jewish babies would have been to interrupt the work of God himself. The midwives came to the same conclusion that Jesus recommended. Jesus said, don't fear those who can kill your body, but not your soul. Rather, fear the one who can destroy both your body and your soul in hell. That's God. In other words, don't worry about appeasing mere mortal men. Concentrate on pleasing the eternal God. The midwives came to the same conclusion as Peter and John and the early church in the book of Acts when the chief priests and the elders commanded them not to preach in the name of Jesus. They said, listen, no matter what it costs us personally, we are going to obey God. Rather than obeying Pharaoh, the charge nurses told the midwives, when you're called to assist with a delivery, just walk real slow. You see, they didn't care about losing their jobs. They didn't care about losing their heads. They cared about losing their eternal souls. When Pharaoh saw that there was no slowdown in the birth rate, he called the midwives in. He said, well, what's going on here? And what they told him was mostly true. They said the Hebrew women are much healthier than the Egyptian women. They deliver too fast for us. That was actually true. Beloved, listen to me. Exodus is not the story of Pharaoh versus Moses. Exodus is not the story of Pharaoh versus the Jewish people. Exodus is the story of Pharaoh versus God. And as someone said, yo arms, too short to box with God. The more Pharaoh resisted God, the more God blessed his people. Listen, here's a word for someone today. In the oddest places and under the most difficult circumstances, God will bless his people. In the midst of crushing slavery, God blessed the Jewish marriages with the joy of copious physical intimacy. He blessed them with vigorous, healthy bodies. He blessed them with fertility and healthy pregnancies and quick, safe deliveries. He blessed them with very low or zero miscarriages or stillbirths or infant deaths. He blessed them with large families. What the midwives said to Pharaoh was true. By comparison, the Egyptians were neither as frisky nor as fit as the fruitful Jews. And just to put the whipped cream and the cherry on top, God blessed those Hebrew midwives with families and children of their own, even more Jewish babies. Finally, Pharaoh could stand it no more. Since his covert attempts to extinguish the Jewish people failed, now he commanded the whole nation to participate in genocide. Now the gloves were off. Now God was ready to fight for his people. Now God was ready to bring onto the scene a history maker. Mothering history makers. Seven qualities of women used by God. God uses women who are called. God uses women who are courageous. And third, God uses women who are spiritually connected. No sooner had Pharaoh issued the decree that all newborn Jewish males should be thrown into the Nile River, but a Levite couple discover that their third baby is on the way. Imagine with me the awful suspense of that pregnancy. What would they do if it was a boy? Sure enough, a son was born, but when Jochebed looked at him, she saw something extraordinary about this child. I have to tell you the truth, I will never forget the moment that I saw my kids' faces for the first time. It's etched on my memory forever. 
When I saw my children's faces, I, I never saw anything so beautiful nor loved anything more in my life. I'm sure that Jochebed felt all those things too, but she felt something more. The Bible doesn't specify what, but, but she saw something special on her son from the Lord. It's mentioned here in Exodus and twice again in the New Testament. She saw that he was a good child. That word good is the same word that God used when he expressed his satisfaction in his creation. God stood back and he saw that it was good. When Jochebed saw her son, she saw something that was created by God. God for a special purpose she saw that there was destiny on that boy she saw that he was a history maker may God give us all eyes like Jochebed may, may he give us prophetic eyes to look at our children and to see that they are good to see that they're God's handiwork sent into his world for such a time as this, that they're created by God for a special purpose. May God give us prophetic eyes to look at the millennials and to look at the generations of, of teenagers and children that are coming behind them and to see that there is destiny on them, to see that they are history makers. Mothering history makers, seven qualities of women God uses. God uses women who are called, courageous, spiritually connected. And number four, God uses women who are creatively determined in faith. God uses women who are creatively determined. The book of Hebrews says that by faith, Moses' parents hid him, not fearing the king's command. They did fear the king's command, but like Shipra and Pua before them, they feared God more. After three months, Jochebed couldn't safely conceal the baby anymore, so she devised a creative plan in faith. Pharaoh said the babies had to go into the river, but he didn't say how they had to go into the river, so Jochebed built an ark. Do you know that the word used for the baby's basket is actually the word ark? It's the same word that's used of Noah's ark. And the only place it's used in the Bible is in Genesis and here in Exodus chapter 2. In fact, Jochebed used precisely the same materials and the same process that Noah used to waterproof his ark. She was following God's instructions to Noah in order to make an ark for her son. She made an ark expecting that God would intervene for her baby just like he did for Noah. Hers was an act of creatively determined faith. Beloved, listen to me. When the house is full and the doorway to Jesus is blocked, faith finds an outdoor staircase. Faith tears a hole in the roof. Faith pushes through the crowd until it touches the hem of his garment. Faith refuses to take no for an answer. Faith provides a witty reply that moves the heart of God. Faith calls out in hope, and when the crowd says, be quiet, Faith shouts even louder. <laughs> Jochebed wasn't expecting her baby to be devoured by crocodiles. She was fully expecting him to be delivered by God. How can we tell? Because she left her 10-year-old daughter there to watch. She wouldn't leave Miriam there to watch a grisly scene. She left Miriam there to watch and see what our great God was about to do. Mothering history makers, seven qualities of women who are used by God. God uses women who are called, who are courageous, who are spiritually connected, who are creatively determined. And number five, God uses women who are compassionate. Soon after Jochebed left the scene 
along came the princess. It's very possible that Jochebed knew where the princess bathed and when. It's possible some have suggested that she was a servant attached in some way to the royal household. We'll find out for sure in heaven, but either way, Jochebed couldn't have predicted what would happen next. When the princess found the baby, the Bible says her heart was filled with godly compassion for him. There are three persons in this story that are described as having compassion. The first is the princess. The second is Moses had compassion in his heart when he saw his brother uh, Jews in the, the uh, bondage of slavery. And the third is the compassion in God's heart when he heard their cries. And so the compassion that, that welled up inside of the princess's heart, it was a special love from heaven. It was a love from God that overflowed her heart for that child. And in a moment of courage, she decided to defy her own father's orders. And she was the only one who could get away with it. Standing on the riverbank was yet another woman who was spiritually connected and courageous. Though she was just a girl, Miriam was a prophetess in the making. And she was able to see, she saw that moment, she saw that God put compassion in the princess' heart and she courageously stepped forward and she offered to find a wet nurse for the baby and she ran off to get Jochebed. Oh, it looks like old Pharaoh, he's sure miscalculated. Pharaoh decided to take out all the baby boys, but it was the women who were his undoing. Mothering history makers. Seven qualities of women used by God. God uses women who are called, who are courageous, connected, creatively determined, who are compassionate. And God uses women who are cultivators of faith. Who are cultivators of faith. Hard to say how long Jochebed had Moses. Under the princess protection, she raised Moses in her own home until he was weaned, probably four or five years old at the most. It's very possible that Jochebed and Aaron and Miriam were permitted to have an ongoing relationship with Moses. Almost 80 years later, when Moses meets his brother Aaron in the wilderness. He knows him. He recognizes him. However long Jochebed had with Moses, there's no doubt that she prayed over him. There's no doubt that she sang over him prophetic songs. There's no doubt that she recited in his ears the stories of Adam and Eve and Noah and of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and of Joseph. There's no doubt that she spoke the word of God and spoke God's prophetic promises over him. We wish that there's so much more we could know about this time period, but here's what we do know. By the time Moses was 40 years old, he was a man who was very clear about his Hebrew identity in spite of all his Egyptian schooling. He knew he was a Jew. He knew what that meant. He knew he belonged to God, and he was a man with godly compassion in his heart. However long Jochebed had to spend with Moses, she was the one who instilled those things inside of him. My prayer is that God would make us cultivators of faith here at harvest time. My prayer is that we would pray over and sing over and prophesy over and recite the promises of God over the next generation until we have instilled within them a sense of godly identity and a sense of godly compassion. There was a new women's exercise class that was getting together for the first time. Most of the group were young professional women and into the room came a mom who was running late and looking very haggard. One of the young professional women looked in her direction and says, and what is it that you do? The young mom bravely pushed her bangs back and she said, I am socializing two homo sapiens 
into the dominant values of the Judeo-Christian tradition in order that they might be instruments for the transformation of the social order into the kind of eschatological utopia that God willed from the beginning of creation. And then she looked at the woman and said, and what is it that you do? Moms, don't ever be ashamed of your call to be mothers of history makers. Mothering history makers, seven qualities of women used by God. God uses women who are called, who are courageous, spiritually connected, creatively determined, who are compassionate, who are cultivators of faith, and finally this, God uses women who commit the outcomes to him. At some point, Jochebed had to hand her son over fully to the princess. Do you know what? I, I think that moment was probably more difficult than the moment that she put him in the Nile. The, the book of Acts says that in Pharaoh's court, Moses was schooled in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. All their doctrine, all their philosophy. He was schooled in mathematics. He was schooled in astronomy and astrology. He was schooled in government and diplomacy. He was schooled in the art of war. You see, in the Nile, Jochebed had put Moses into God's hands, but in Pharaoh's palace, he was awash in the river of Egyptian culture. I think it took more faith for her to put Moses in that river than in the Nile River. And the same is true for us. Before our children and before the next generation growing up in front of our eyes, we do our best to live lives of conviction. We do our best to live lives of courageous faith, to live lives of compassion. We do everything we can to cultivate their faith but then we have to commit the outcomes to God. Jochebed never lived long enough to see her son come back to Egypt with his face radiant with the glory of God. But what were the outcomes of her faith? First of all, she was the first Israelite woman to spoil the Egyptians. When God met Moses in the wilderness in a burning bush, God promised Moses, he said, Moses, the Israelite women are going to spoil the Egyptians. They're going to leave Egypt wearing their clothing. They're going to leave Egypt wearing their jewelry. They're going to leave Egypt carrying all their gold. You know, the first Israelite woman to spoil the Egyptians was Jochebed. She was a slave who received compensation from Pharaoh's daughter to nurse her own Jewish son in her own home in defiance of Pharaoh's orders. No wonder David said, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. What were the outcomes of Jochebed's faith? Second, she had bragging rights about her kids three times over. So I guess Jewish moms, like all moms, like to brag about their children a little bit. Three Jewish friends met for lunch one day, and they started bragging about their sons, nice Jewish boys. The first woman said, my son, he is such a success that for Mother's Day, he bought me a six-month cruise all around the world. The second woman said, my son has done so well that for my birthday, he flew me to Miami with a hundred of my friends to celebrate for a week. The third woman sat up and adjusted her collar a little bit and she said, I want you to know that my son is the most devoted son a mother ever had. Three times a week, he pays $400 an hour to see a psychiatrist. 
And you know what he talks about the whole time? He talks about me. <laughs> if any mother in Israel ever had bragging rights, it was Jochebed. Her daughter, she became a renowned prophetess. She became a worship leader. She became a women's leader. Her eldest son, he became the founder of the Jewish priesthood and the first Jewish high priest. And her youngest son, well, he was Moses. What were the outcomes of Jochebed's faith? She celebrated in both testaments of the Bible. She celebrated in the Jewish scriptures and the Christian scriptures. She celebrated by the Jewish people and by Christians alike. And most importantly, she celebrated in the annals of heaven as a woman who, with a little help from her friends, mothered a history maker. Mothering history makers. I want all of our moms to stay seated for just a moment. Your mom, would you stay seated? And I want all the rest of us, would you stand on your feet? And I want us to give a great big standing ovation to our moms who are called and courageous and connected and creatively determined and compassionate and cultivators of faith and committed to God. Come on, let's give our moms a great big standing ovation this morning. Now moms, would you join us? Would you stand? And let's give one great big praise to our Father in heaven and to our Savior, Jesus Christ, who's worthy of all glory and honor. Would you give him a great big praise today?